you know, asked me to be, uh, you didn't really need to ask me because that's the way I usually am, but he, he asked me to be provocative. And uh, I said, well, it's not going to be possible to be provocative at this session because reality is much more provocative than anything I could invent. Uh, if we're uh, uh, simply listening to the, to the news these days, uh, uh, does give a slight sense of uh, 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 not global order, but rather great global uh, disorder. that September 11th uh, was uh, uh, what some analysts call a transforming moment. It wasn't simply a defining moment, to use uh, a, a, an expression which had been coined during the Gulf War, uh, but, it, but a transforming moment that is, in effect, if we take the last half of the 20th century, we have had a period of Cold War, we have had a period of post-Cold War, and now we have uh, yet a new period, uh, which uh, people with a facetious turn of mind would call the post-post-Cold uh, War era. Uh, some people call it the hyper-terrorist era. Uh, obviously, there is no name yet, but that, in effect, we have been witnessing the third major change uh, in uh, the global order uh, since the, the, end, uh, the end, as it were, of the Second uh, World War. Uh, now, uh, before going into uh, the, this, the, this new global order, uh, just a few words of reminder of uh, the previous two phases, Cold War and post-Cold War, uh, picking out those elements which help us understand what is going on today. Uh, first, the Cold War. Uh, and I need not dwell at, an, at any sort of length. We all know that this was pretty much a bipolar era, uh, that uh, deterrence prevailed at the center of the theater of politico-military operations, that is, in Europe. Uh, peace, peace of sorts was maintained uh, in Europe through the, dual, through the combination of the balance of nuclear terror and the existence of the two uh, major blocks, uh, East and West. Uh, wars did occur, and indeed quite important wars, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, to mention only those two, were very substantial conflicts indeed, but those were wars which were essentially waged at the periphery and or by proxy. Uh, uh, practically never were American and Russian soldiers, Soviet soldiers, face to face uh, fighting each other uh, during, uh, during that period. A last point, which I, I, I'd like to emphasize, talking about the Cold War, because it has some relevance to the period in which we are now entering. And that is, it took us 40 years to find out who was going to win and who was going to lose the Cold War. For 40 years, we, we, nobody knew who was going to win. Uh, uh, which, when you think about it, is a, was a, is, a, is, a, is a rather strange situation. Normally, you can try to deduce who the winner is or who the winner is going to be in a, 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 in a, in a major war, even when the battle is enclosed. You know, after the Battle of Stalingrad in 42-43, it, it became pretty clear that barring some unforeseeable surprise, the Axis was going to lose the war in the face of the Allies. In the case of the Cold War, in the mid-1980s, it was still quite impossible to say who was going to prevail. Uh, and and this, this, uh, th this situation of non-determination was in itself an encouragement for the antagonists to pursue the conflict, uh, since each one of them had, uh, had some reasons to believe that he would prevail over the other, or vice versa. Now, moving to the post-Cold War era, which, be, which uh, began sometime between, let's say, the fall of the wall in November 89 and the, beginning, and the beginning of the Gulf War invasion of Kuwait, let's say, in August uh, 1990. Uh, now, two, two words are often used in characterizing uh, uh, the beginning of the post-Cold War era, 
the first word is unipolar. Uh, 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 one American academic, and uh, Ro Roland will, will jog my memory, uh, 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 coined the expression, this is, the, this is, the United, this is the America's unipolar moment. Uh, the United States as sole superpower. Uh, and this, of course, is something we will, we will come back to. But the other word, which also comes to mind, uh, uh, which can also be uh, summarized through an expression, that word is multilateral, which, which stands in, obviously in opposition to unipolar. Multilateral or what uh, George Bush Sr. called the New World Order. Uh, that is, uh, a, a multilateral order based on uh, the, pr uh, the primacy of the UN Security Council. And this is indeed ver what we very briefly had in 1990, 1991. That is, simultaneously, the US as the sole superpower, uh, preeminent, uh, leading the Gulf War coalition, and at the same time, a very multilateral moment uh, since everything that happened did occur under the aegis of the UN Security Council with extremely tight, close political uh, consultation, cooperation, uh, not only between the P5 as such, the, the permanent five of the Security Council as such, uh, but also quite directly between the capitals, Moscow, Washington, London, Paris. The end of the Cold War released forces of conflict in Europe which had hitherto uh, been kept under control because of the disciplines of the East-West conflict. Uh, first and foremost, obviously, the breakup of Yugoslavia. As long as there was the perception in Yugoslavia that, uh, that, uh, that war between East and West could occur and that Yugoslavia had a vested interest in remaining in one piece, war did not happen. As soon as the confrontation ended, the forces, uh, the centrifugal forces uh, in, uh, the Yugo in the socialist federal um, uh, state of Yugoslavia, Republic of Yugoslavia, uh, uh, became preeminent and very quickly, that is by the spring of 91, uh, the country was falling apart and war occurred again in Europe. But setting aside these wars, the wars of Yugoslav succession, which have taken place from 1991 to 2001, uh, and setting aside other conflicts, such as the, uh, the, the problem we had uh, at the Transnistrian section of Moldova, uh, or uh, more significantly, the Chechen war, uh, Europe, in effect, became an area of uh, is, uh, of, of lessening security concern. No outside power was seen as threatening European states with military intervention. And this, of course, was a major novelty uh, 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 vis-a-vis uh, the Cold War period, in which, of course, the basic assumption was that if war broke out, it would break out right in the heart of Europe. Uh, and this, in turn, uh, had three corollaries. The first corollary is that the armed forces of the European countries had to reinvent themselves, uh, moving away from national defense uh, to force projection. Force projection for a very simple reason, since conflict was not going to happen on one's own soil, uh, and if there were reasons of national interest or collective interest uh, to uh, 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 favor stability, uh, through the use of force, well, then it, it could only be done through force projection, projection, projecting force into Bosnia, for example. Uh, secondly, uh, NATO uh, was faced with an existential challenge, uh, sensible. NATO was created at the end of the 40s for reasons which are obviously directly related to the perceived threat uh, from the Soviet Union. And in the absence of that threat, legitimately the question could be posed, well, why should one keep NATO? After all, the Warsaw Pact uh, had uh, dissolved itself by the spring of 1991. Uh, uh, and somewhat paradoxically, and to the surprise of many, 
during the 90s, during this post-Cold War era, NATO uh, managed not only to survive, but to, prog to, but to become the preeminent security organization, to remain the preeminent security organization in Europe. Indeed, during the Kosovo War, it waged its first, and I, I immediately add in parentheses, and probably its last, uh, major, uh, major war. Uh, I say major because it, it also got involved, but in a, in, a, in a smaller way, in the Bosnian operations in the summer of 1995. And the third corollary was the birth of European security and defense policy, with here essentially three stages. First stage, in 1996, at the, at the Berlin summit of NATO, uh, the European and the North American countries, members of NATO, the, uh, decide uh, that in certain circumstances, uh, NATO assets uh, can be transferred, can be, lent, can be loaned over uh, to uh, a, a group of countries, member states of course, conducting military operations which are not strictly NATO operations. So second stepping stone, Saint-Malo, 1998, the British and the French decide together that U European defense is something which has to be handled by the only heavyweight European organization, uh, that is the European Union, and in that framework to give pride of place to force projection. And third, at the end of 1999, uh, the so-called, the setting of the so-called headline goal, that is the notion that by 2003, the EU states, the European Union states, would put together a rapid reaction capability uh, of 60,000 uh, soldiers plus the naval and air, uh, air forces capable of holding the field for at least a year uh, and uh, deployable within less than, uh, less than, less than 60 days. We had seen during the 70s and in the beginning of the 80s extremely active terrorist organizations. A Black September, multiple plane hijackings, Olympic Games massacre, etc. Very spectacular stuff. And in comparison, and, and of course in the 80s, the Beirut bombings against the Americans and the French, and very, very, very serious stuff. And paradoxically during the 90s, notwithstanding some, very, some fairly serious outrages, notably against American interests, terrorism didn't actually look uh, as if it were a new major challenge in comparison to what it had been. As we know today, this was a misperception. But at least this is the way, what it, this is the way it looked like during the uh, post-Cold War uh, era. <coughs> during this period, we also had a, uh, a, a honeymoon period, if I can put it that way, in the Middle East. That is, from 1992, essentially from the end of the, of the Gulf War in 91, until September 2000, uh, we had a peace process. Uh, for the first time in a very, very long time, the habitual mode uh, of interaction between Israel, its neighbors, and the Palestinians was not one of war. Things were not easy. Uh, things were tricky. There were obviously, obviously not everybody agreed that peace was the game to play, but this was a, uh, this was a comparative lull, and it lasts, after all, nearly nine years. And it, and it is one, actually one of the defining characteristics, in retrospect, of the post-Cold War era. In looking at the place of the United States in the global order, uh, it is useful to reflect on what makes the U.S. a superpower. Why is the United States a superpower? And uh, 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 the, the question may sound too obvious to pose, but it actually isn't as obvious as that. Uh, uh, first of all, one can say, of course, the U.S. is a superpower because of its economic weight. It's true, the United States is the is the, the main engine of technological creativity. It is by far, as a nation state, the largest economic 
power, 22-23% of world gross domestic product. But when you look back over a century or so, you find out that the United States had a similar economic weight from the beginning of the 20th century onwards. On the eve of the First World War, the United States represented slightly more than 20% of the world domestic product. Yet the United States not only was not the world's only superpower, it wasn't a superpower. But then, of course, uh, people will also respond to that by saying, but you know, look at the European Union. In economic terms, the European Union represents 24-25% of the world GDP. It is not a superpower. Of course not. But it does have sovereignty as a union in, for example, trade matters. So in strictly economic terms, and of course in financial matters through the, uh, through the European Central Bank. Uh, so in other terms, if one sticks strictly to economics, uh, here is not the explanation why the US is the world's only superpower. So is it military expenditure and military reach? Well, there's a better case for that. Uh, the US, after all, does spend uh, 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 more than 35% of world military expenditure. This, is, uh, this does put the US clearly in a class of its own, uh, not only because the European <coughs> Union doesn't have, in defense terms, the equivalent of the European Central Bank or, it, or, its, uh, or its centralized trade authority, uh, but uh, if you add up all of the defense spending of the European Union countries, you arrive at around 20% of world military expenditure. So there is a real difference between the US and anybody else who follows. And obviously, m much larger amounts of money than those mobilized uh, by, let's say, uh, China uh, uh, or, or, uh, or any other Asian state. Uh, but there are limits to what can be done with military tools. First of all, because many, indeed most aspects of international life are not settled through the use of weaponry. And secondly, <clears throat> and in strategic terms, just as importantly, uh, the fact that the US is and will remain for quite some time the only country to have truly global military reach, because that is what the 35% of world military expenditure gives the United States gives it the United States the capability of operating where it wants uh, and when it wants. And this is a, a capability which is unique to the United States. So where does, that, where does that leave us in terms of America as a sole superpower? Well, to me, the answer to the question, the, the deep, the underlying reason why the US is the sole superpower is indeed its unique capability, uh, not only today and, uh, uh, and in the world as, as we know it, but even in historical terms, the Amer America's unique capability to create and to sustain permanent alliances in political and strategic terms worldwide. East Asia, the, the system of bilateral alliances between the US and Japan, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, the collective alliance, NATO, and uh, less well known, but it was actually activated after September 11th, the organization, the, the Treaty of Inter-American uh, inter Defense, which was activated in much the same way as NATO's treaty was activated uh, 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 the day after the September 11th attack. This is what gives the United States uh, its unique uh, capability. And if one accepts that line of reasoning, which is obviously open to debate, but if one accepts that line of reasoning, then you have a corollary. That is, if these alliances wither, or if they're replaced by something less permanent, less constant, then the US runs the risk of ceasing to be a superpower. I now move to the allies, to America's allies. What does it mean after September 11th to be an ally of the United States? And here, something has begun to change very fundamentally. Uh, we're not sure yet 
how f deep the change is going to be, where it is going to take us, and indeed whether it's going to take us as far as what I was suggesting a few minutes earlier, and that is to, uh, to a situation in which America's ability to be the sole superpower would be impaired. But let me lay out the elements of change. First, NATO. I said a few, uh, a few minutes ago that Kosovo was NATO's first major war, but probably also its last. Uh, uh, this in itself is not a new hypothesis. It was already coined uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Kosovo War uh, for two reasons. Uh, one was that it was rather painful uh, for the Americans and indeed for some of the European allies uh, to have a war run by committee. It was run by committee, uh, not ineffectively, NATO won the war, uh, but with a lot of tension, great difficulty, uh, uh, French-American interaction, to take that particular example, was not always very happy. Uh, uh, this is something which was rather different than, let's say, the Gulf War, where you also had a lot of political military consultation, but it was not really by committee. Uh, but there was a second reason, more, more serious, uh, less well acknowledged at the time, the Americans found it extraordinarily painful uh, to run a war with two conflicting chains of command. An American chain of command from the Pentagon and a NATO chain of command run from Belgium. In both cases, an American general was in charge, but uh, that didn't make things easier. It made things more difficult. You did not have a clean chain of command. The Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington wanted to fight their war. The NATO chain of command thought that it was supposed to run the war. And the war within the war between the JCS and, uh, and SACUR was, uh, 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 would, uh, would, would have been a tragedy if NATO had not won the war. Uh, since NATO did win the war, it looked more like comedy. But a, a conclusion a uh, basic conclusion which was drawn uh, by the Americans at the time was never again. You know, we want a clean chain of command, like in the Gulf War. And, of course, from a military perspective, this makes actually eminently good sense. Second item, uh, Article 5. NATO has an, an Article 5 which posits uh, in case of aggression against a member state, that other member states will consider an attack against one to be an attack against all and to provide the relevant means, including possibly military means, uh, to uh, help the aggressed party. Now, this article w was never, never kicked in during the Cold War, precisely because the war remained cold. And for the first time, on the aftermath of September 11th, Article 5 did kick in. The United States considered, in my view quite rightly, September 11th as being an act of war, therefore Article 5 had to enter into play. And on September 12th, the NATO countries unanimously shared this view. But in doing so, uh, including at the Secretary General's level in NATO, uh, the point was immediately made, but Article 5 has no element of automaticity in terms of providing military help, military assistance. And this, of course, in strictly legal terms, is true. Article 5 is loose and ambiguous in its language because it was, uh, uh, well, because it was uh, uh, framed that way in 1949 so that the remaining isolationist elements in the US Senate could agree uh, to uh, America's first permanent binding collective defense commitment. Uh, but during the Cold War, we had all assumed, Americans and Europeans, that Article 5 was actually much more strict than the legal language. Well, on September 12th, we all decided that Article 5 essentially meant pick and choose. So what do we have? Well, in a sense, we have a shambles. Uh, NATO is no longer a collective defense organization, and NATO is no longer a collective defense commitment. NATO is a place of consultation between the United States and Europe on security and defense issues, and it is a very important and very effective service organization, providing assets, NATO assets, to those member countries who require them. 
And this is where I come back to what I said about 1996 Berlin, uh, uh, where the Europeans, particularly the British, the French, and the Germans, uh, secured this commitment that NATO assets could be transferred to European-led operations. Or at least that was the assumption. Then comes September 11th. <coughs> Within a week, the Americans came along with a list of eight points saying, here are the NATO assets which we would like in order to conduct our American operation. We want five NATO AWACS radar aircraft to patrol American airspace while American Air Force AWACS are sent to the Indian Ocean so that they can operate under an, an American chain of command in the framework of the war against the Taliban. Uh, and here are the NATO naval assets in the Mediterranean, which we would like to be able to call upon uh, in order to be able to release some of America's naval assets in the eastern Mediterranean so that they can go to the Indian Ocean, all of which is perfectly fair and good and naturally immediately accepted by the other NATO countries. But this was not exactly what uh, the framers of the 1996 summit in Berlin had in mind. Uh, uh, this is a very, very different NATO. Uh, uh, and uh, there's an element of irony of history uh, in, in, in what is currently going on. NATO and then ESDP, European Security and Defense Policy. Uh, where here again, the events of September 11th are having a, an immense impact, uh, even if the sense of the impact still remains unclear. What do we know? We know the following. First, that the Americans in their eight points have asked the Europeans to fill in, if so requested, for Americans leaving the Balkans. And of, obviously this is accepted. Secretary General of NATO has said so, and he's right. And if the Americans want to withdraw people from Bosnia, Kosovo, so on, uh, we will fill in the gaps, uh, presumably also by being able to draw upon NATO assets. Uh, in other words, within fairly short order, I would expect the Balkans operations to be essentially European operations using NATO assets. Now, this in itself, is perfectly natural, but it also means that another tenet, another basis of NATO's operations will have been removed. That is, NATO was always based on the assumption that we were sharing risks together. Here we are not in a risk-sharing situation, we are in a division of labor situation. The Europeans do Europe, the Americans do the Indian Ocean, if I can put it that way. Is this abnormal? No, it's not abnormal. Is this is this business as usual? No, it's not business as usual. This is, in effect, the end of another aspect of NATO. The other thing that we know about, uh, 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 about Europe's uh, security and defense policy uh, is that uh, we, we will have in 2003, if all goes well, and for the moment things seem to be going more reasonably well, we will have a force which will be able to fulfill tasks, the so-called Petersberg tasks, which have actually rather little to do with the kinds of contingencies which we, are, which we may have to face in September 11th. Uh, chasing terrorists in uh, Afghanistan or Somalia is not part of the Petersberg tasks. Uh, going after the Taliban is not part of the Petersberg tasks. Uh, should we therefore not go after the Taliban and terrorists? Of course not, I believe we should. But uh, clearly, uh, we have, uh, we, in 1999, we took the right decisions to wage the wars of the 90s by the time we got to 2003. And therefore, the Europeans are going to have, to, if they want to remain relevant in terms of the security and defense policy, are probably going to have to change, uh, to some extent, the missions assigned to the so-called headline force, the rapid reaction force, uh, and therefore also possibly reconfigure it so as it can, can meet the new tasks. And the last thing that we know about the, about the Europeans is that they have what will, uh, appears now to be, to be a constitutional rendezvous in 2004 in which the European Union will either integrate further or probably, if not disintegrate, uh, possibly move backwards somewhat. We don't know which it is going to be. Some of the signs are towards more integration 
in the wake of September 11th, anti-terrorist measures have been of a highly integrative measure, notably in the, in the judicial area, where in effect states will no longer need, will no longer uh, function vis-a-vis -vis traditional extradition procedures, but where arrests against, peop uh, for against people who, ha uh, who incur uh, 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 jail penalties of uh, at least one year will be arrestable in any European country without any diplomatic uh, without any, diploma uh, any diplomatic interaction being required. This is obviously highly integrated. Conversely, in the defense arena, because of the manner in which the US, and from its standpoint, very fittingly uh, acts, which is uh, trying to bring together those assets which it needs to wage the war. If these assets are British, it takes British assets. If the French have some, they'll take French. But of course, the Americans here do pick and choose. And this, of course, is not exactly conducive uh, to uh, uh, the, the strengthening of a, U of a European presence as such in the security and the defense field. The United States, the Allies, uh, the non-state actors now. Uh, in the comments which have been made here and there since September 11th, uh, some analysts have been saying uh, we, are, we are now witnessing the return of the nation states against the rise of the non-state actors, uh, with, of course, Al-Qaeda being uh, singled out as uh, one of the non-state actors. Uh, and this, of course, is to some extent true. Uh, anybody, and I think most of us did, who watched television on September 11th, uh, will have recognized uh, that uh, uh, it, it was the leaders of states who were in the forefront. President Putin, President Chirac, President Bush, etc. Uh, no, no Romano Prodi from the European Commission, no Javier Solana, no head of Greenpeace, no head of Amnesty International, and uh, until, the, until early October, Osama bin Laden himself kept very quiet. Uh, the return of the nation state, so it looked like. This, however, should not be pushed too far in analytical and therefore also eventually in operational terms because the reasons which have given rise to the power of the non-state actors, those reasons are not disappearing. These reasons are called information technology and globalization. The, the notion that individuals and groups have a higher degree of empowerment and a higher degree, uh, a, a higher ability of establishing cross-border solidarities, uh, of uh, operating in real time with a level of information and sometimes power as nation states, those things are not going to disappear. Uh, unless one does away with the information technology revolution, which is obviously impossible, and if one does away with globalization, which, piece, which, which is which is not quite as Im impossible, uh, but which would have the same sort of penalties for the world system, for the world order, as the end of globalization had in 1929-1930, when we, when we had an episode of return to a non-globalized uh, non world. Uh, so the reasons why the non-state actors are powerful, whether they're benign NGOs, or whether they're malign Al-Qaeda, or the narco traffickers, the transnational mafias, uh, these actors will remain powerful and nation states will only be able to uh, uh, retain a degree of control of the situation only if they, are, if they demonstrate an ability to, in, to uh, work together with those non-state actors which share the same value system as the, as the relevant state uh, actors. Uh, this, incidentally, uh, has a, uh, a malign corollary uh, 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 because we may also see at the opposite end of the spectrum a, a, a higher degree of interaction between terrorist non-state actors and a number of state actors. We have seen this between the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Uh, we do not know yet whether 
uh, there has been a broader interaction or if there will be a broader interaction. But it isn't impossible, particularly if we move towards a clash of civilizations type of situation. This brings me to the following element in the world, in the New World Order, and that is, of course, the Middle East. Uh, the Middle East, which uh, had been through a fairly benign phase during the 90s. It looked benign because we had a peace process, but some aspects were obviously not so benign. The not so benign aspect was the growing disconnect between the growing populations of the oil states and the decreasing resources of the oil states without any significant political change, economic change or social change to accompany this disconnect. You take Saudi Arabia. And I'll, I'll be speaking a little bit about Saudi Arabia in the next few minutes. Uh, you take Saudi Arabia. The population of Saudi Arabia, uh, Saudi Arabia has doubled over the last 25 years. Oil revenues in Saudi Arabia are about half in real terms, or slightly a bit more than half, of what they were uh, in, uh, 25 years ago after the first oil shock. Well, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to figure out that the standard of living per Saudi has been divided by close to three over the last 25 years. And Saudis, uh, who have now been to the best schools in the West, who had you know, cradle-to-grave social security systems, etc., who had been raised in the expectation that they wouldn't really have to work to earn a living and uh, uh, that they would have a, a pleasant life as long as they didn't try to get involved in politics. Uh, uh, well, these, these people are now discovering that not only they have to work, and do jobs which are not pleasant, but that there aren't any jobs anymore. And the atmosphere in some of those countries, and particularly Saudi, is today distinctly unpleasant. Uh, the potential for destabilization uh, has, uh, is, uh, uh, was growing during the 90s, and because of the confrontation between the Wahhabi, Bin Laden, a largely Saudi group in Afghanistan on the one hand and the, and the Americans and their allies on the other, uh, uh, a place like Saudi Arabia, which is pretty much like the Soviet Union used to be. And let me get into that analogy uh, for a second. Uh, this is getting distinctly uh, disquieting. Uh, made the parallel with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union was created, as everybody knows, uh, after the October Revolution in 1917. It brought together disparate elements of what had been the uh, Tsarist Empire. It was based on an ideology, uh, and its ultimate pretensions were not territorial. They were ideological and global. Now, Saudi Arabia was created uh, at around the same time, the completion, the territorial completion of the state occurred in the late 20s. Uh, the legitimacy of the government was based on an ideology, Wahhabism, uh, and the pretensions of Islam, uh, uh, because it's a religion, this is not a slur on Islam, but simply because it's religion, it is a religion, its pretensions are obviously not territorial, uh, its pretensions are spiritual, and therefore potentially global. Uh, it's a state based, therefore, on an ideology. And pretty much as happened with the Brezhnevs and the Chernyenkos of the Soviet Union, the ideology, after a, few dec after a number of decades, was honored in the breach rather than in, uh, uh, in, in <coughs> faithfulness uh, to the initial uh, sources of the state, which, of course, brings fourth groups like the Bin Laden people, whose principal enemy beyond the Americans is, of course, the so-called hypocrites, which is the word that they use, who govern the Gulf monarchies and primarily Saudi Arabia. And as in the case of the Soviet Union, Saudi Arabia is, brings together very disparate elements of territory. And, and, in, in a, and in a sense, even more so than in the Soviet Union, because the east, the center, and the west of, of, of current Saudi Arabia had never historically been governed 
by the same state entity, whereas the Tsarist Empire had, after all, existed for a number of centuries before the Soviet Union, which, which in effect means that we have here a state which is ripe for things which may look like the disintegration of the Soviet Union, with an added twist is that this happens to be the, be the Middle East, where change tends to be extremely violent, and that it is also the world's first source of oil, uh, which of course means very nasty things happening to the world economy if something goes wrong there. So the new world order after the September 11th means a much higher focus by all of our countries, Europe, North America, uh, Russia, of course, vis-a-vis uh, -vis a region which appeared to be stabilizing during the 90s, but which has now become uh, possibly the most important source of risk and instability. If we want to uh, see Afghanistan not become yet again a spawning ground uh, for uh, non-state uh, actors, whether they're terrorist groups or narco uh, traffickers, and of course Afghanistan was not only the source of Al-Qaeda, but also uh, the, the, the world's largest source of opium and heroin, uh, then we're going to have to, I think, be present in Afghanistan, possibly along lines not too different uh, from those uh, we have witnessed uh, in uh, Bosnia, Kosovo, or, or East Timor. Of course, if we're lucky, we'll see a coalition government representing uh, the bulk of Af Afghanistan's population uh, as it were, take over and run the country with the help of the international community. But the history of Afghanistan suggests that uh, uh, it may not be that simple, and uh, a UN stewardship uh, of Afghanistan uh, is something we may, uh, which may have to be considered, and indeed the Secretary General's rep special representative for, uh, for Afghanistan, Ms. Ibrahimi, uh, I, I think uh, is, is looking at the various options uh, in, 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 in this regard. Of course, Afghanistan is substantially larger in terms of territory and population uh, than any of the uh, Balkan or <coughs> territories or than East Timor. Uh, so this would be uh, quite a novelty uh, for, for the United Nations. But it, it is an hypothesis which uh, one should not disregard. It is clear that uh, uh, north-south uh, disparities, uh, the extraordinary income inequalities between north and south, and which have grown over the last decades, uh, 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 do create a lot of resentment, may uh, help provide re uh, recruitment fodder, as it were, uh, for terrorist groups. Uh, that being said, uh, uh, the profiles of the Al-Qaeda uh, men uh, who uh, led the 11th of September attacks and indeed other Al-Qaeda outrages during the 90s are not exactly the wretched of the earth. Uh, uh, these are usually upper middle class uh, children uh, with uh, good uh, uh, medium and upper level educations uh, in, the West, in the Western educational system, uh, mostly from Saudi Arabia, uh, which is, by any standards, a comparatively affluent uh, society. Uh, so one should not establish a direct link of causality between the north-south divide and what happened on September 11th. Simply, there remains the broader point that, of course, uh, it is important to reduce the sources of resentment in the world. China uh, was fairly slow in determining what its line uh, uh, would be after September 11th, uh, but it has also been fairly clear uh, that, first of all, the Chinese have adopted uh, the two UN Security Council resolutions uh, uh, enshrining, as it were, uh, the fight against uh, terrorism. The Chinese also joined the World Trade Organization by ha uh, uh, very shortly after September 11. Now, this happened to be a happen chance, but uh, uh, it, it is a sign of uh, uh, the forces of China's opening to the world uh, taking the upper hand. Uh, China, although very uneasy about uh, American, uh, the United States becoming present in Central Asia, 
Uh, China has also made it clear that uh, they would cooperate, particularly in the so-called Shanghai Organization framework, uh, in the fight against terrorism in Central Asia, along with Russia and the Central Asian uh, republics. Uh, and uh, Beijing no doubt expects, and indeed they've said so, uh, that the U.S. would reciprocate uh, in uh, the field of missile defense or on Taiwan uh, uh, in the fullness of time. Uh, I am not sure uh, that these Chinese hopes will be accomplished. Uh, it, probably, it may not have been particularly clever for China to have presented the bill uh, uh, so early on in what promises to be a, a very long uh, meal, if I can put it that way. Uh, uh, Russia, which has uh, uh, also very good reasons uh, to uh, ask a number of things of the United States, has not played up uh, the quid pro quo aspects has avoided presenting uh, presenting a bill at a time when what the Americans are asking for is is is, is cooperation and sympathy. Uh, so uh, China's positioning, uh, although clear, although overall positive, is one which is more fragile and uh, more open to disappointments uh, than in the case of Russia. The, the September 11th will uh, have, in a sense, reinforced NATO. It has invoked for the first time in its history uh, its Article 5, the, the collective uh, uh, help uh, assistance uh, article, as it were. Uh, at the same time, NATO has been signally absent uh, from the organization of the operations against the Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, uh, which is, in a sense, perfectly normal, but it is true that in this crisis, NATO is more like a service provider and a political clearinghouse uh, than a, a, a political military uh, alliance with executive powers. Uh, will this help or hinder NATO enlargement? I, I suspect that NATO enlargement will be facilitated, if only because Russia's rapprochement with the United States and NATO uh, should make it uh, rather easier to combine uh, the enlargement process of NATO uh, with the tightening of the ties between NATO uh, and Russia. And indeed, uh, some statespersons like Chancellor Schroeder uh, or the Italian foreign minister uh, have come forward suggesting uh, that, uh, that Russia, in the fullness of time, could belong to NATO, which is a perspective which President Putin also has raised uh, on a couple of occasions. The new era, and it is indeed a new era, uh, is one characterized first of all by the uh, emergence in practice of what analysts used to call new terrorism. It was a great uh, element of debate uh, over the last few years. Uh, now the debate has been solved. New terrorism is alive, it's kicking, and it is murderous, and it uh, can commit and is willing to commit acts of mass destruction. So that's a first and obvious change. Secondly, we've had uh, Russia's uh, uh, rapprochement with the West, which in itself is a, a very significant geopolitical change. And the measures we're going to have to take in the war against terrorism uh, will, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, curtail or curb some of the aspects of globalization, uh, which uh, in a way uh, may be positive uh, but in many other ways could be negative because, of course, uh, uh, restricting the flows of capital uh, through uh, very close monitoring, slowing down those flows, making it more difficult for people to move from one continent to another, uh, these, uh, uh, making it more difficult for information to cross borders uh, easily. All of these things are not going to be good for economic, uh, for economic growth. So this is, this is a world where non-state uh, non actors uh, of the more nasty variety, like terrorist groups, are going to be a major factor, uh, but uh, where also we may have slower economic growth, where we may also have uh, societal impacts uh, in terms of individual freedoms, uh, which are not always going to be particularly pleasant.